Tripod-mounted terrestrial laser scanners have been around for about 30 years now. They're reliable, they're accurate, but compared to other methods of 3D scanning, they're slow. Now, when I reviewed Regal's VZ600i a few months back, we saw that it started to challenge the idea that using a static laser scanner versus a slam scanner meant a big hit to production. After all, the VZ can perform a terrestrial laser scan capturing 2.2 million points per second with imagery and a point density of 6 millimeters at 10 meters in under one minute. We're talking about 60 plus scans per hour or two to four times faster than its closest tripod mounted competition. In fact, when I made that review, I questioned whether or not that kind of speed of data acquisition would start to take market share away from slam scanners considering their main selling point is speed. Well, if terrestrial scans performed in under one minute still wasn't fast enough, what if we could take that scanner and throw it on a backpack, top of a car or deck of a boat and capture that same 2.2 million points per second, but do so without having to stop to acquire data? Today, we're going to explore the kinematic capabilities of Regal's VZ600i and how they were able to take the fastest terrestrial laser scanner on the market and free it of its tripod to allow us to not only capture ground-based LiDAR extremely fast, but also do so retaining the highest levels of accuracy and detail of the objects we are capturing at a level just not possible from the vast majority of SLAM scanners on the market. Let's get after it. It's important to understand what the kinematic mode of the VZ600i is and is not. First of all, the kinematic mode doesn't use a traditional SLAM algorithm to correct the scanner's trajectory. If you're unfamiliar with this term, the trajectory can be thought of as the path the scanner takes as it moves through the environment it's mapping or the pose, aka position and orientation over time. Instead, it relies heavily on high accuracy GNSS measurements via the add-on GNSS antenna whether those are taken using real-time kinematic or post-processed kinematic to correct the trajectory along with information collected from the inertial navigation system of the scanner and overlapping LiDAR measurements. As the VZ repeatedly rotates 360 degrees, it's measuring common features with the LiDAR sensor over and over again and collects redundant data that it will use in post-processing via a strip adjustment. Conversely, SLAM rather relies on real-time map building and localization associated with their SLAM algorithms. The VZ shares a lot more in common with mobile laser scanning than traditional SLAM scanning. Where SLAM tends to use the information from the IMU to propagate motion over shorter lengths to undistort scans and use the information from the LiDAR sensor as the primary source of information to mo maintain global accuracy, mobile scanning tends to rely more on using the IMU measurements coupled with the GNSS derived positions to maintain global accuracy. Now, of course, this kinematic processing methodology comes with drawbacks and benefits when compared to a SLAM scanner that does not use GNSS observations for trajectory correction. First and foremost, with the VZ, you need decent line of sight to overhead GNSS satellites. Now, it doesn't need to be 100% consistent, especially if you're using PPK to process the GNSS data, but the longer the break in the view of the sky persists, the longer the trajectory goes without correction from GNSS. Of course, there is still other methods of trajectory correction going on, but it does need GNSS measurements to ensure optimal accuracy. As such, this is not an indoor scanner. If you had a project that was both exterior and interior of a building, for example, you could use the kinematic mode on the exterior and switch over to traditional stop and go terrestrial scanning with the VZ to map the interior merging the two data sets with overlapping data and common control points. And this is probably the biggest drawback of the kinematic mode of the VZ when compared to traditional SLAM scanners. But I don't really wanna call it a drawback per se. It's more so that you need to understand what it's meant for and what it isn't. 
In some situations, slam will perform much better, and in others, kinematic will have the upper hand. If you caught my Slam Wars episode on the ZNF FlexScan 22, you noticed it was able to provide a point cloud with fidelity matching what we would expect from traditional stop-and-go terrestrial scanners. Now, as I've worked my way through the Slam Wars series, I've had a chapter in each episode titled Slam Smoothing, where I've isolated various areas in the testing datasets and looked at how different scanners were able to retain complex geometry and fine details of the objects they were meant to map. Perhaps slam smoothing wasn't the correct term to use, as that term is incorrectly placing the blame of the loss in fidelity of the point cloud on the slam algorithm, when in fact, the majority of influence is coming from two other sources. To an extent, the filtering algorithms of the post-processing are smoothing out features as a byproduct of trying to clean noise out of the data, but even before that happens, the beam divergence is the major culprit that's causing our loss in fine details. You see, almost all traditional SLAM scanners on the market are using LiDAR sensors that were not purpose-built for surveying and mapping. They're making use of relatively inexpensive LiDAR pucks that were originally designed and built for autonomous navigation and have been repurposed for mapping because it's much more cost effective to use a mass produced LiDAR sensor that is already available versus designing and building one from the ground up. And if you compare the market share of LiDAR sensors being used for navigation versus those being used for surveying and mapping, it's fairly easy to see why companies like Hasai focus on making a sensor that is optimized for the lion's share of the market. And having a large beam divergence while a negative aspect for mapping is actually advantageous for navigation. If a self-driving car is traveling down the street at 100 kilometers per hour, you really don't want an object that could collide with that car slipping in between neighboring beams, hence why they made their LiDAR puck with a relatively large and expanding beam. But when Regal, for example, designs and builds a LiDAR sensor from the ground up with the sole purpose of surveying and mapping, they can optimize the beam divergence, among other parameters, for the intended use of surveying and mapping. Just like how ZNF also purpose-built their LiDAR sensor, which explains why we saw the FlexScan's dataset was able to retain a much higher level of point cloud fidelity compared to the scanners using LiDAR pucks, originally intended for navigation. And when I started going through kinematic VZ datasets, I saw exactly the same thing. It doesn't smooth corners or erase small features. Two common pitfalls of using a SLAM scanner that has a large beam divergence. The VZ also has a significant advantage when it comes to point density. A Hisai XT32 LiDAR puck, which is a very popular choice for SLAM scanners, is capable of up to 680,000 single return points per second. The VZ600i is capable of 2.2 million single return points per second and an over 300% increase in potential points. And when we're talking about LiDAR capture in motion, one of the limiting factors of how fast one can travel and thus how long it takes to capture a site is the scanner's points per second count. And further to that, the VZ has two modes of operation with kinematic scanning. Radar, where it continually spins 360 degrees, and fixed frame, where the orientation is locked. So when using fixed frame and pointing the scanner at the object of interest, you're focusing 100% of those 2.2 million points on exactly what you want mapped and not losing points mapping objects you don't care about and that will be filtered out later. As we'll look at it in a moment, the level of point density you can get even from a very quick pass is very impressive. Because processing of the kinematic mode of the VZ relies heavily on GNSS measurements and less so overlapping points, like a traditional SLAM algorithm does, it doesn't really need the consistent iterative loop closures SLAM is synonymous with. It obviously doesn't hurt to start and end on the same spot when collecting kinematic data, and it can benefit from mapping the same area more than once, but you're not stuck spending time constantly looping back onto areas you've already collected. When we start looking at some of the VZ600i kinematic datasets, we can see a common theme. 
None of them have true RGB values. At this time, imagery cannot be processed with the kinematic mode of the VZ, and thus you are restricted to colorizing your data by intensity values, elevation, etc. However, this is something Regal is actively working on. I was fortunate enough to get together with Regal and head out with them to my usual testing site armed with one of their 600 eyes and a backpack mount designed to hold the scanner above the person wearing it so it can capture a full panorama of points as they walk. Something to keep in mind, the backpack mount available from Scango Europe or Regal USA is but one of several ways to capture data kinematically with a VZ. You can mount it to a vehicle for corridor mapping with the appropriate hardware of course, or leave it on its tripod and set it up on a boat to get some shoreline or below deck mapping of a bridge or use a dolly if you'd prefer that over the backpack option. If you have a secure way to mount it to a moving platform, you stay under 25 kilometers per hour and retain a somewhat reliable view of the sky, you can kinematically map with the VZ. Tanner Dutton of Regal's USA North American headquarters captured the exterior of the parking garage in two passes, once in radar mode and once in fixed frame mode. This was done because an initial pass with the radar mode is always required as the rotation of the scanner maps the same object at many different time epochs, which is essential for high accuracy refinement of the trajectory. The fixed frame mode is then used to add in a significantly higher level of point density. He traveled at a relatively quick walking pace as he made his way around the building without slowing down or aiming the scanner at any particular features. I'd say he was walking about 50% faster than I typically do when using SLAM scanners, and I was actually quite surprised he was finished as quickly as he did. He spent maybe 10-15 to 15 minutes at the absolute most combined for both passes on this 250,000 square foot building, and when I got the data set back, it was so dense, I was halfway skeptical that I was looking at the same data set he captured when I was there until I saw the artifacts in the cloud caused by me filming during his walk. And even more impressive than this was that the data set was captured during light rain and the ground and walls were all wet during capture and it appears to have little effect on the quality of the end result. Now of course there were scan shadows, but that's really more to do with the path walked and not to do with the actual scanner. The point density was definitely sufficient from those two quick passes for the vast majority of applications. And like I alluded to a few minutes ago, the detail retained was on par with the same test site captured with the VZ in the stop and go mode. I don't have enough check shots around the perimeter of the building to reliably assess the accuracy of the point cloud, but from visual inspection of the sectioning I did with both datasets roughly aligned to each other, it appears that the kinematic dataset was pretty close in terms of accuracy compared to the stop and go dataset. And when I started comparing distances between various walls on each dataset, I didn't find any deviations over a centimeter. The green points here denote the kinematic capture and the red points denote the static stop and go capture of the VZ. Now the kinematic dataset has a bit more noise, which is to be expected, we're capturing data from a moving platform after all, but it's certainly not a night and day difference by any means. If I were to compare this to some other SLAM scanners, there would be a very obvious difference in noise and detail retained. So while it may not be quite as clean or accurate as static scanning, it is very close and certainly much closer compared to your average SLAM scanner. Obviously one of the greatest benefits of these newer generation 3D scanners we're seeing that can be used in multiple configurations is the massive cost savings in both hardware and software. With ZNF you can turn your terrestrial laser scanner into a backpack or dolly mounted SLAM scanner. And with Emerson's STX, you can turn your backpack or handheld SLAM unit into a UAV or vehicle mounted scanner. Not having to buy multiple sensors and multiple processing packages can really help the pocketbook in being able to use one scanner in multiple configurations on the same site is very handy and can allow you to capture data more efficiently. Now to turn your VZ600i into a kinematic scanner, you have to make sure you have the optional GNSS antenna, which if you don't, 
there will obviously be a minor additional cost on the hardware front. But that antenna does have benefits when used in stop and go scanning as well. And you'll need to purchase an additional license to allow you to process a kinematic data in RyScan. I believe this cost is somewhere in the neighborhood of $13,000 US at the time of this video, so it's not too bad. Since my last VZ600i review video, there have been some interesting updates from Regal. You can now access their project map from the screen directly on the VZ, which is a very welcome addition versus having to use the app previously. They also improved Ryscan's ability to use black and white checkerboard targets. You essentially give Ryscan some example data of what to look for on one target based on intensity values and the size of the target, and it goes through the data and finds the remaining targets that can then be used as you would retro-reflective targets previously. And with this method, you don't need to find scan targets in the field. There is also now a travel backpack for the VZ along with a quick release that are available as add-ons to the scanner, both things that I pointed out I wish I had access to in my original video. Also in my original video, I mentioned how I experienced severe lag when trying to visualize several hundred scans at a time in RyScan. Regal pointed out a workaround for this is to create an awk tree point cloud, which is essentially a unified and decimated point cloud, which does unfortunately mean you cannot export the panorama images embedded into it. So if that's important to you, then there is a trade-off there. Perhaps we'll sort out a workaround for this in the future. And finally, they pointed out the reason for the larger raw file size that come with the VZ compared to some other terrestrial laser scanners, such as the RTC, is the fact that the VZ is capable of multiple returns. While this does mean heavier raw data, it also comes with the benefits of a scanner capable of multiple returns, vegetation penetration being one. And of course, you can filter these out in post-processing. If you're anything like me, you're probably wondering why Regal chose to take the kinematic or mobile route instead of SLAM. I think there are probably a few factors at play here that led to this choice. Regal scanners have traditionally served a market that focuses on outdoor capture. Mines, earthworks, civil infrastructure, monitoring, etc. It's much more likely you'll see an RTC 360 scanning a central utility plant for a BIM model than you will see a VZ. And conversely, it's much more likely you'll see a VZ in an open pit mine than you will an RTC. And that being the case, if I had to choose SLAM or Kinematic for the kinds of environments Regal's customers find themselves in, it's Kinematic all day long. I'm certainly not taking a PLK to go to a gold mine for monitoring or stockpile measurements. And Regal has been working on mobile and kinematic processing algorithms for decades. They're good at it. It would be an odd choice to reinvent the wheel, so to say, to develop a SLAM algorithm as an add-on to a scanner whose primary use doesn't really align so well with the environments SLAM is optimized for. Not to say they won't get into the slam market one day, they're obviously very capable of doing so. It just wasn't today and it wasn't with the VZ. So can I put the official third dimension stamp of approval on the VZ600i's kinematic mode? Not quite. This wasn't meant to be a full review or breakdown of the kinematic mode of the VZ. This was more so a brief introduction into how it works with some surface level examination into the data. I didn't see anything wrong with it and I was honestly quite impressed, but I haven't spent nearly enough time with it to emphatically recommend it. If you own a VZ600i already, I would reach out to Regal and see if you can get a trial for the kinematic license and run your own tests. You don't need to buy a backpack just to test it. Pick it up by the tripod and walk with it. It should be fine for testing purposes. And if you do, leave a comment here so we can all get some more opinions on how it works. If you don't own a VZ yet, I can certainly attest to its capabilities as a static scanner and perhaps I'll be able to do some more testing and a deeper dive in the future to fully iron out the kinematic mode of the VZ600i. So if that interests you, stay tuned and I'll see what I can do on that front. Thank you all for watching and as always, subscribe if you want, like if you feel it's warranted, and I'll see you next time.